This video reviews the slides um, on two, two topics that are related. Uh, one is the basic concept of force measurement, and uh, the, the second, which is a little bit longer after a brief discussion of force measurement, is uh, strain gauge concepts. Consider just these simple ways of measuring force. Um, you have a spring, couple spring scales here. Uh, this is really sort of a uh, balance. And note that uh, both, and these are just simple examples to get across the point that in both you need some deflection that's induced by forces, right, uh, to uh, infer uh, force. And it turns out that that's fundamental to, to all force measurements, even those that use other sensing principles. So let's talk about measuring force uh, through deflection. Uh, I'm going to say that to measure force or torque, it's usually necessary to design some kind of a compliant mechanical structure, uh, you know, one that can deflect. This, this structure is usually some kind of a sensing material uh, or a device, and the com some common ways of doing that, uh, if you think about sort of the causal processes, the force will induce some stress in a structure or a mechanical element and that leads maybe to some strain uh, or deflection in general and uh, and then that deflection can be monitored sensed in different ways we're going to talk about strain gauges which is a case of a resistive effect talk about what that means but there's other, there's others there's uh, some that use ceramic crystals uh, that might be piezoelectric and uh, you might also detect deflection in other ways using some non-contact optical ways. We won't talk about those. We'll talk mostly about uh, the strain gauge methods uh, shortly. Here's a real simple example of how you can build a force sensor just by measuring deflection. All right. So I had this little application where I was trying to measure uh, forces applied on keyboard keys. And these are very small forces, somewhere on the order of about um, anywhere from 50 to about 100 grams. Um, not very much force, right, as you know. But uh, didn't have a force sensor that could go down that low. But I did have ways of measuring positions. I had actually um, the ability to measure displacement. So what I did was I rigged up a very light little spring here between two moving elements. Right, so this the you know this part here could move, and then I could also measure the motion of this top element. Okay, so I could measure the this rod actually goes through here to this tip here. All of this structure is related, so I can measure this displacement. I can measure this displacement, which these are the same here. So from those two differences, I could get this delta x. Right, if I knew then precisely what that spring displacement was, I could then measure force. Very simple. So I could apply uh, motion, measure the displacement, and that would give me the force measurement. Let's now talk a little bit about how we can make force measurements actually using a measurement of strain, which is a very common way uh, that uh, uh, this is done, and a lot of force sensors or force transducers, if you want to call them that, that are available commercially off the shelf. Um, are made using strain gauges. Others, are, again, are made using other types of, of sensing um, uh, uh, materials, mechanisms. Um, we'll focus more on strain gauges. So, just first, uh, a quick review of the strain gauge concept, and this shows top view uh, and a side view of a basic, what we call foil strain gauge, and that's this type here. Um, really, the strain gauge is very simple. It's just a resistor, and you know, you know from past uh, uh, courses in in circuits and so on. If you have a length of material, it has some resistivity, uh, some area. The resistance, right, is is rho l over a. So you can see that if I stretch or if I change the geometry right in any way I'm going to change resistance. Well that's how the very first concept of a 
just the wire being used to measure strain was um, was used to measure uh, force and also, you know, if you like, uh, deflection of materials and so on. Eventually, these were mounted on these uh, substrate materials that could then themselves be mounted on a specimen. So now, does any of that specimen under strain, if these are uh, attached, uh, induces that strain onto the substrate material, which has embedded in it this this wire, which is your strain gauge, and you just basically have across here a basic resistor, right? Because that's all that a strain gauge is, is a basic resistor that can change. Okay. So these are sort of electrical type resistors. Uh, in the 60s, it started making semiconductor strain gauges right onto um, uh, you know, semiconductor materials so you can make these uh, on microelectromechanical devices and uh, integrate strain gauges into uh, very small packages and um, many um, strain gauges now that are used in sensors uh, rely on semiconductor type strain gauges. So a strain gauge is a sensor. We need to talk a little bit about its sensitivity, right? And the sensitivity of a strain gauge is called the gauge factor, and we'll use G for that, but uh, there you may see other um, variables used to denote st uh, st strain gauge gauge factor. And the gauge factor is very simply um, the, the ratio of how much, right, um, the, res uh, the uh, resistance of the strain gauge changes per unit strain, right? So theoretically you can show that G depends on two elements if you, if you look at that. Um, one is a part that's purely due to the, ma the material property and, and new here is uh, Poisson's ratio. And the other is this, what's called the piezoelectric effect, sorry, piezoresistive effect. And, and this tends to be a part that's also temperature dependent. And it turns out that that's, that's small, but sometimes you have to worry about that. If you can take away any temperature dependence and you know, compensate for that, then your G then tends to be constant. And just to show you that there's different ways that strain gauges are made, they have different gauge factors, right? So obviously a larger gauge factor is good because if you have a small strain, you get a large change in resistance, right? If you have a larger gauge factor. And so you can see how there's, um, these are nickel chromium all the way down to platinum, iridium. You get higher gauge factors and then semiconductor, you know, very high gauge factors. And uh, so that makes them very sensitive, but there's also some drawbacks to using those. So here's an example of how you can calculate, well, if I know a gauge factor and I strain a material, say, by a microstrain, what, what kind of resistance change do I see? So you can just use that basic formula, as you can see here. Say you take a metallic foil strain gauge, and the manufacturer tells you you've got a gauge factor of 2. It's got a resistance of 120 ohms. So you take the gauge factor, multiply it by the applied strain, the actual resistance of the gauge, and you can find how much your delta R is, how much has it changed. You can see very small resistances. This is why, you know, this is a, what is it, 2,000% uh, change in gauge resistance. So it's very hard to detect these very small changes in resistance. So often we'll actually configure resistors into different types of circuits that make it easier for us to either detect the resistance or actually to convert it into a voltage change. And that's the way we'll commonly uh, do that when we're trying to build, say, a force sensor of some type. If you're actually interested in measuring strain, then you want to measure, say, the, the actual resistance change. But if you're actually just building a device where you just need to detect, okay, how much has something changed when you apply some kind of a force, then um, you don't have to worry about actually measuring the particular st strain value. You just need to measure, say, a voltage change. So I'll show you some examples of that. Just some more discussion on different strain gauge types. In particular, the, uh, the semiconductor strain gauges, as I already mentioned, have very high gauge factor values. There are some difficulties and disadvantages to their use, but typically these are used in a lot of different types of sensors. They have lower strain limits than metallic type, which are the foil type that 
that we often use in the lab. They're also more expensive and they're temperature dependent. But again, given that they have very, they're very sensitive, they can be used, especially when you have the need to get in, into very small packages. Right. Right, so now we want to talk about how strain gauges are used, especially uh, to measure force. And the most common way that we do that is we'll put strain gauges into a beam configuration. And that's how we use these in in our lab. Uh, the beam structure, the geometry is really nice. So if I, here's an example of a cantilever, which is a very common way. We know that uh, the stiffness of the beam, very easy to predict, right? We know the Young's modulus, the area moment inertia, the length. You know, it's easy to predict this, this stiffness. So if I put a tip load on this little cantilever, it's easy to predict how much it deflects. We can calculate the bending strain, right, and also this strain at any location. So wherever we might place the strain gauges, it's a very predictable type of design. And that's one of the reasons why beam configurations are used. And also they're, they're easy to mount on beams. So you can build packages that are, um, again, easily to, easy to manufacture and so on. This slide just shows a couple of different beam configurations for measuring different types of forces or even torque. So the, the most common one that you'll see is, and this shows the cantilever beam, here's the tip load there, and, and there's four strain gauges, two on top here, see that, and two on the bottom. And those are wired together, as we'll see shortly, into a Wheatstone bridge. But you might, so this is for, me for measuring a, um, a force that might be applied at the tip here. You want it to, if you had a element that had axial forces, you can see there'd be a different way to mount those strain gauges. And you can find in some handbooks um, and other locations different, different, sorry, different references. You can find a, a different beam um, and strain gauge configurations and some of the advantages uh, that you have. We often will, will use four strain gauges. By doing this, you know, uh, you can think about how that keeps all the strain gauges at the same temperature. And so if there's any strain uh, induced by changes in temperature, they all tend to cancel out based on how you mount them on this beam. I won't go into too much detail on that. Um, but if that's something of interest to you, it's easy to find uh, good references on that in some textbooks and handbooks. Uh, here's one where you can measure actually uh, shear strain. This tends to be a really nice way to measure forces sometimes because it becomes less dependent on the location of where the force is applied because your shear strain uh, will tend to be um, equal across that beam. And then if you needed to measure a torque, for example, you could mount these in, in a 45 degree angles and there's strain gauges that are made specifically for mounting in these kinds of configurations. So I wanted to basically show you again how you can find um, strain gauges mounted and also different types of strain gauges that are used for different types of applications. The most common way that we wire these strain gauges um, is into a Wheatstone, uh, what we call a full bridge if they're all connected. As you see here, so imagine these are four resistor, resistive strain gauges and um, mounted on the beam as shown here. This is the, the, the full beam, full sorry, full bridge configuration. You can see the number one and four, the two on the top are opposite uh, on this bridge and two and two and three on the bottom. If you ever are involved in, in, in making one of these, very simple to build. Um, and you wire these up into a full bridge and then you basically apply a voltage here and measure the output across uh, the other two terminals as you can see across the bridge there. And very predictable then, the output voltage is then a function of the resistances. And so when you um, look at the output voltage, you can see it's going to depend on these resistances. You might have imbalances here, so sometimes you have circuitry that will balance the bridge and give it a null condition. That way it's zero when there's no forces applied, right? And and um, if, 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 the, if, if, if the resistance, the ratio of resistance 1 to 2 is equal to the ratio of R, R3 to R4, then, then this will give you a zero output, right? You can see that from there. Um, otherwise, you need to you know, have a, um, a, a balancing circuit that will make the zero if you want a zero value when there's no forces applied. Again, what I was wanted to get to was by looking at this out at the output here, you can say, well, what is 
when I do apply a force and the resistance changes, remember according to the uh, gauge factor relation, and you can see how that's all put into this little formula here, for this little circuit here, for the, for the gauges mounted the way we have them in our lab in a full bridge configuration, you can look at this nice relationship you get very predictably. It says that the change in the output voltage per applied you know, input supply voltage is only dependent on right, the gauge factor and the strain. And note that there's positive and negative signs here. Two and three are negative, but those are on the bottom. So if you apply a force on top here, those are going to be in compression. So the sign will be canceling. In fact, this ends up being you know four times strain, right? Because they're, and they're all equal if you mount them at the same location, also the same distance from the neutral plane. And so you get a nice gauge factor times strain relation where the strain is the strain value at that location on the beam. So a very predictable type of output from this. Uh, and here's actually the final formula. So, so again, uh, um, you can see why this uh, design approach is very common. It's a very predictable and um, you know fairly easy to uh, to understand once you uh, dig into the details. This slide really I want to bring home the point that as I mentioned before strain gauges when they change right you the strain is imposed you get a resistance change. When you put them in a bridge the bridge is used to transform those resistance changes into voltage changes so the general concept is, uh, you know, any kind of bridge, you can use the general term of impedance to mean resistance, capacitance, or inductance. So any sensor that relies on any of these electrical quantities, when you put it in an impedance bridge, it allows you to then convert what you want to measure into a voltage, which, as we know, is something that we can more effectively measure using a data acquisition system or some other kind of instrument. Um, so that's the whole reason for using a bridge is that we transform an impedance change into a voltage change. So now in this slide I wanted to summarize sort of the whole system design of a strain gauge instrument, right, in kind of block form. So the strain gauge, it's part of sort of a multi-stage process and you can kind of keep these little icons, uh, these images of these of these icons in, in, in mind. It makes it easy to understand, oh, as long as I understand how I get strain from the structural element, um, I'm and for this, for example, this bridge, I multiply by gauge factor by resistance, and I can I can I can get a delta R. Once I understand a delta R, that's converted through a bridge, a little bridge symbol, into a voltage change, and then because those voltage changes are relatively small, not it's hard to measure as resistance, but you still need an amplifier. So these sort of represent the key elements that you need in the strain gauge system. So at the output, you have a nice amplified output voltage that you can then calibrate and relate it to strain or to force and torque, whichever quantity you're interested in measuring. Finally, I wanted to show you the system that we have in the 144L lab. Um, we've mounted a strain gauged beam. We have strain gauges located close to here. Why do we put them at the end? Well, if you put in tips here, tip loads here, you know, you have your bending moment diagrams, so you have bending strain much higher here at the end, so you get, you know, higher strain, higher changes in resistance, more, um, uh, you know, sorry, not more, but higher changes in voltage per, 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 so it's a more sensitive if you put them down here. Strain levels are going to be very small, obviously. At the long. Now, if you wanted to measure strain along the beam, obviously you could put strain gauges here, but we're interested in building a force sensor. So we have a cantilevered beam. Sometimes we'll use an LBDT here to measure displacement. Um, so this shows, as we already discussed, how they're mounted on the beam. Again, we put them in a wheatstone bridge, and then here is a, a photograph of the uh, amplifier that we use from, um, from Omega. Uh, and this gives us a nice DC output voltage that can go right into a data acquisition system.